Welcome back. Today, we're going to start by talking about virtual memory. We'll cover the hardware side in this lecture, and in the next lecture, we'll cover the software side of virtual memory management. Some of this might be a bit of a review from the computer architecture course that you previously took, but we'll go into a, a bit more depth and look at how virtual memory evolved, the segmentation and paging approaches that are still in use today, and then consider two different processors, x86 and MIPS, that approach presenting this to the operating system in very different ways. In the next lecture, we'll see the software side of this. So let's motivate this a little bit by understanding this example. So if we think back to the early descriptions of the operating systems, one of the key ideas in the OS is the idea of running multiple applications concurrently. So if we just laid out the OS and all the applications together in memory, we could run them at the same time, right? Switch between these different apps and have the OS in charge. But what happens if one of these applications needs more memory? Well, we'd have to move everything around to find some free space. Or maybe there's no space left than in, in that machine and we'll have to save one of these applications to disk and then later restore it to continue executing. Also consider the cases where some application, for example, Emacs has a bug and scribbles all over the OS memory. We don't have a real mechanism to protect that yet. And also, if you think back to your compiler course, the language in the compiler specifically needs to be able to generate code that's going to be position independent, that's going to be independent of the address for this to work. Otherwise, it's easier for the compiler to think about an application where the addresses are fixed. All of these problems and more are addressed through virtual memory management. And there's been many ways that has, this has been done over the past. We'll start with a really simple approach. And if you continue pushing this approach to its logical conclusion, we'll end up with paging. Sharing physical memory obviously has its drawbacks. To be very clear, we have three main drawbacks. The first is protection. We don't have a way to prevent processes from damaging each other's memory or damaging the OS memory. And we need something to do that. The second is transparency that a process shouldn't be aware of the physical address it's running on. It would be nice if we could tell the compiler that it has control of the layout of memory, and then the application is unaware of uh, what address we run it at. The common thing to do for applications that are set to a specific address and need to be moved is that they'll be a relocatable executable, and during loading or running the program, the operating system or the loader for the operating system will have to patch the program. We'll have to rewrite the binary to adjust the addresses. And this is time consuming and tends to slow down the loading. So we want to avoid this. Also, if you make your binary position independent, which is actually really commonly done today for security purposes, where you want the attacker to not be able to guess the layout of your program, these techniques tend to add a few percent overhead to your application and are only done when necessary for server applications. Lastly is resource exhaustion. We can't tell the programmer the size of any given machine. Your laptop from your phone to your desktop are all gonna have different amounts of memory, different numbers of cores, so anything we can do to abstract that resource from the developer is going to make it easier for programs to write software that is independent of the specific hardware. So the goal of virtual memory is to give every program its own view of the address space. So it believes that it's running in its own memory independent of all other processes and it can't see any of these other processes. The way that we're gonna do this is that we depend on a hardware component that's usually inside the processor called the memory management unit. The memory management unit is gonna translate all addresses, whether they're code or data operations, from a virtual address into a physical address. 
the virtual address corresponding to the view of memory that the application holds, and the physical address being where the actual memory is located in the physical memory chips. Whenever an address isn't satisfied by this memory management unit, it's going to trigger a fault handler and give control to the operating system that will fix up the memory management unit and give it the correct translation or terminate the program if the address is wrong. The memory management unit will also be able to do other tasks like enforce protection, verify that pages that are read only are only read from, pages that are executable can be executed from. And this also allows us to give a program more memory than physically exists on the system. Because what we can do is just map in the pages that are currently in memory, in physical memory, map them in the MMU. Anytime an application tries to access memory that is not mapped in the MMU, the fault handler will be triggered, allowing the operating system to read the memory that's requested from disk or somewhere else, and restore it to physical memory, and then fix up the mapping in the memory management unit and continue executing the application. Virtual memory has multiple advantages. The first one being that it's easy to relocate a program while it's running in memory. We could move portions of it to different parts of physical memory or even move part of it to the disk when we don't have enough memory. One of the key things that we can do is this idea of swapping, moving memory to disk and then bringing it back when necessary. And the reason that this works is something known as the 80-20 rule. Just briefly as an aside, generally, when we think about resources on a computer hardware, as I mentioned in the first lecture, these resources are underutilized. So we have lots of cores on our laptop, but how often are we actually using all of those cores? Most of the day, those cores aren't doing anything. And even when we're doing work, most of the time we'll see that it's idle. While maybe a computer game might use all the cores, when we're working on editing our code in between compilations, our computer's idle and not doing anything. Something on average, it, the 80-20 rule suggests that 80% of the resources are gonna be underutilized and about 20% are gonna be used actively. So in this case, in the context of memory, what this means is that for a program, a large program, most of memory is not actually being used actively, it's idle. So we could swap some of that idle memory to disk, leave only the active parts in physical memory and bring back idle pages only as necessary when the program tries to read or write to those pages. The MMU allows us to do these mappings and allows us to intercept these attempts to access memory that is idle. And we'll see in the OS lecture portion of the virtual memory management section that we'll see how this is actually implemented on the software side. The main challenge though that this system introduces is that virtual memory is an extra layer of hardware and software, and it's potentially slow because of that. Let's look briefly at a few ideas that have been tried throughout history, and this is gonna help us evolve into segmentation, the first type of virtual memory system that still exists today. Here, we have a simple load time linking so I mentioned this in an earlier slide where we can take a program that was designed to run at a specific address, modify the binary. Usually this is done with some hints that the compiler gives to the operating system or to the loader for the operating system and modify it so that it can run at a specific address. So here you can see in the example that we have a jump to 2000 hex. And the program was linked at 1000, but now we want to run it at 4000. And what this means is every address needs to be, we need to add 3000 hex to every address. So you modify each jump and every call instruction within the program, adding 3000 hex to the address to make it work at this specific address. So what are the problems with this approach? As I hinted earlier, <clears throat> 
This approach doesn't deal with protection. It also means that if we need to move this program around in physical memory later, it'll have, we'll have to pay a serious cost. And we have to think about data pointers. We'd need some way to deal with all of the data that has addresses in it, which makes it essentially impossible for most systems. And finally, this also has a much slower load time. We have to read the entire binary, parse it, and then figure out what addresses need to be patched for the program to run at this new address. So let's introduce a really basic modification to this. And the idea is that we're gonna have a base and a bound register. These are two special privileged registers that the operating system can set that allow us to have our first type of virtual memory. We'll take any address in the virtual address space, add base to it, and then check whether that virtual address is within a certain bound. If it isn't, we can trap to the kernel. So how does this work now? Well, now we don't really need to patch the binary. We'll actually jump to the correct address because the virtual addresses will all have the base added to them. So we'll add 3000 as our base and we'll have a bound of 6000. So for any address computed, we'll be able to adjust the mapping and ensure that the program can run at this address. So this partially solves our problem, but it still has some downsides. How do we move this application if it needs to grow later? There's not really much we can do except to move anything else out of the way and find a single contiguous chunk of memory that fits the entire application. And we can do that by changing the base register. And when we switch between different programs, the operating system just has to reload the base and bound registers, making it fairly inexpensive for the operating system. So let's go through a few definitions before we see a more complicated example. In our view, programs load and store virtual or sometimes referred to as logical addresses, while the actual memory accesses are done on physical or real addresses. The virtual memory hardware is referred to as the MMU or memory management unit, and it's usually part of the CPU. Although if you found much older systems, the MMU was sometimes an independent chip on the motherboard. The MMU's registers that allow reloading the bound and base, etc., are only going to be accessed through privileged instructions on the CPU, ensuring that an application can't tamper with it. And it's going to do the job of just translating virtual to physical addresses, allowing every application to have a unique view of memory. So the goal here is that I can have a set of applications here colored in teal, red, and green, and I can map them arbitrarily to physical addresses in physical memory. And on the side, we'll see that the OS will be sitting somewhere in physical memory as well. So let's think briefly at the trade-offs between the base and bound approach. The advantages in terms of hardware is that I only require two registers. It's very cheap to do the add and the compare in parallel to make this cost effective. And it, it's actually been used in some hardware. So if we look back at really old systems like the Cray-1, essentially just use a base and bound approach. The disadvantages, as we mentioned, mean that growing applications is expensive or sometimes impossible. And there's also no way to share code. So this is kind of an interesting thing that virtual memory, more sophisticated versions of virtual memory can give us, which is imagine that libc or c library is used by virtually every application on the system. That c library can easily be shared between all the applications if the code is read only. So these are ways that we can reduce the memory use within a system and improve even cache efficiency. So one solution to this is to have multiple segments to separate out the code 
the stack and data segments and essentially have multiple base and bound registers that can be used at the same time. This brings us to the first design of virtual memory that is still commonly used today, which is segmentation. Segmentation allows processes to have many base and bound registers. The address space is built from the collection of all these segments. And it allows us to share memory at the granularity of an entire segment. Imagine the C library was in its own segment, then the C library could be shared if we can make it a read-only segment. And even the binaries themselves, like GCC, can be shared if we make them also read-only segments. And usually the way that this works is by specifying the segment as part of the virtual address. So one of the architectures where you see this today is in x86, and it resembles this quite clearly, where there's a segment number and an offset within a segment. And this is gonna be looked up in a table that the processor has that contains the protection bit, saying whether it's read, write, or execute, the base address, and the length of that given segment. The base is used to add to the offset, while the length is used to compare the offset to see whether or not it's a valid offset. If not, or if the protection bits are violated, we'll get a fault allowing the operating system to take control and decide what to do with the application. Each process is gonna have its own segment table with a set of segments, and each virtual address is indicated by the segment and the offset together. Sometimes the segment is just the top bits of an address. So you could imagine concatenating the segment number and the offset together. Hint, this is a lot what paging is gonna look like. Or hint, this is a hint that paging is gonna look awfully similar. <clears throat> In other architectures, the segment is selected through an instruction or a parameter to an instruction. So in x86, the way that segments works is that there's a set of segment registers. There's a code segment, a data segment, a stack segment, and several extra segments available to an application. The application can reload a segment and it has specific instructions that allows an application to call a segment that's not currently loaded, reloading that segment as long as it has permission to do so. So here, let's look at an example where we're concatenating the segment number and offset into a virtual address. The first digit has two bits for a segment number and the remaining three digits of this hex address or 12 bits are the virtual, are the offset within the segment. We also show here on the left, the segment table that shows the segments that are valid for the application. Segment zero is read only, and segments one and two are writable, maybe data and the stack. And the last segment, segment three, is unused, so it's not readable or writable. So let's look at a few addresses within this to see how this computation is done. So the first address I put here as an example is 0240. So what's the segment number? The segment number is zero. So we go to the segment table and we can see the base and bound. And then the offset within the segment is 240. And we can see that it's less than the bound, right? The bound is 6FF. So we just take 240 and add 4000 to it to compute the physical address. So we see that that address resides within the yellow region within this slide on virtual and physical memory. Again, we can look at 1108. 1108 is segment one. Its offset is 108, which again, if you check it, it is okay with the bound, and it's gonna reside in the purple region. So it maps to the very beginning of physical memory. Remember that from the program's perspective, these addresses are the valid addresses in the virtual address space. 
The physical addresses are completely transparent to the program. The program is going to be aware of segments, but it's not going to be aware of where those segments lie within physical memory. So you as a programmer don't have to think about the physical layout. The operating system is doing that work for you. We'll see in later lectures when we talk about I.O. and devices, how this can play a role, particularly with paging. Let's look at a couple more examples. So 265C. So two is still corresponds to segment two. 65C is still below the bound. So this is a valid address within the green segment. And now what about 3002? Well, 3000 corresponds to segment three. And we know that that segment is not readable or writable. So it's going to trigger a fault and give control to the OS. In most cases, the OS is going to terminate the application. And one last example is 1600. Here, it corresponds to segment one, which is a valid segment. But if you see the bound and you compare it, it's bigger than the bound. So it doesn't actually reside within that region, within segment one. And this also will call, cause a fault, giving control to the OS to decide what to do. So segmentation has a set of trade-offs. It has some advantages, which is now we have multiple segments per process, and it's gonna allow us to share segments. As I mentioned, we could potentially map the same segment, readable or writable, between processes. And we don't need to keep the entire process in memory. So when you get a fault that a segment's not available, it might be that that segment's been swapped out. And we can read that segment from disk and then resume execution. But the disadvantages of this are that it requires translation hardware, which could have a performance problem. And this translation hardware is typically complex. <clears throat> no, okay. So the disadvantages are that this requires translation hardware. So on really small, low power or embedded devices, this could be a, a real problem. But on most bigger computers today, this isn't an issue. Segments are also not completely transparent to the program. The compiler has to deal with switching between segments if it wants to share segments or have more segments than just the code, data, and stack, for example, in x86. And typically these operations are going to be costly, requiring the processor to support reading them out of memory and whatnot. Next is that the segments still have to be contiguous within physical memory. I can't take a segment and split it across two physical addresses. I have to keep it contiguous in physical memory. This is making fragmentation a serious problem because whenever we run different programs in memory and programs exit are created and destroyed all the time, then we're going to have gaps in between our programs that are fragments. This is memory that we can't necessarily use until we move other programs around and have to involve stopping applications and moving them in physical memory. So let's look at fragmentation in a little bit more detail. Fragmentation basically is the inability to use free memory. So if you look here at this diagram, we have a bunch of programs and we have the stack at the bottom. And the programs, as you can see, they're fairly large relative to the white regions of memory that represent free memory. Those little free chunks are too small to load another instance of Emacs or GCC, but maybe they could be used for a smaller application. So if you look though, all of those segments together should be larger than the size of another application similar to GCC and Emacs. So the only solution is that the operating system will stop applications, move them to compact memory, and then be able to use that memory that was previously fragmented by trying to put it together into a single large size chunk. 
Another way that this plays out is internal fragmentation. Note that this is external fragmentation. Internal fragmentation refers to the memory within a segment that isn't being used. So over time, as the program's running, we're gonna end up with these two kinds of fragmentation. These variable size pieces, these small holes that we refer to as external fragmentation, and, these fi and problems from fixed size allocations where we have no external fragmentation next to it, but we have internal waste known as internal fragmentation. What this is all leading to is paging. Paging is the logical conclusion of segmentation if we make two main changes. We use fixed size segments or pages and we concatenate the segment number and the address bits or the offset together. So let's look at briefly paging at a high level before we start looking at examples of real hardware architectures. Paging divides memory up into a bunch of small pages. Typically, most architectures have taken a four kilobyte size as their main or primary page size. And some architectures allow you to select several page sizes that are typically some multiple of this size, usually powers of two. You can map virtual pages to physical pages and each process is gonna have its own set of mappings. And this is gonna allow the OS to gain control on certain operations, making pages read only, making them invalid, making them executable. And the OS can take control of the application of the processor whenever one of these things are violated, allowing it to either alter the mappings and resume the application or terminate it if it's violating some kind of property that the application was trying to enforce, possibly often for security. Some other features that are often found in paging systems is that hardware usually has an accessed and a dirty bit allowing us to carefully track what memory is in use and what memory is idle. This is useful for the swapping that we briefly mentioned earlier in the lecture, where remember that most of the application's idle and we could save it on disk and then bring it back from disk when it's needed. The question that you have to ask is, how can I actually figure out what pages are in use and what pages are idle? And the way that it's done is through these access and dirty bits. Often the execute bit is, as I mentioned, a separate bit that most modern architectures support. This helps mitigate some of the security attacks that have been done. And there's extra controls in most architectures for controlling memory caching or the memory consistency as we talked about when we talked about synchronization in earlier lectures. Pages eliminate external fragmentation this simplifies allocation and freeing and backing of pages with swap because everything's a uniform size. It's very easy to make a linked list of pay free pages in the system. And another nice property is that because most segments conceptually would take several pages, the average internal fragmentation should be half, roughly half a page, assuming that the length of a given segment that an application needs is uniformly distributed. Let's look at a simplified view of allocation and why this makes it easier on the OS. If we look here, we have two applications I'm showing and just assume that they were to run on a single segment, GCC and Emacs. GCC is coded in green and Emacs in yellow. With paging, those segments are broken up into uniform size regions of memory, and then they can be mapped to arbitrary pages in physical memory. As you can see, GCC is no longer contiguous, and a portion of it is in a low address and a portion in a higher address. In the case of Emacs, two of those pages are in memory and one is on disk. If the program attempts to access any address in that region, the mapping should be marked invalid by the OS, which will trigger a fault giving control to the OS handler to then read the data from disk and load it into physical memory. This allows us to store these idle pages 
and only bring them into memory as needed so we could potentially pack more programs or larger programs in a smaller machine. The paging data structures look an awful lot like segmentation. The key difference, as I mentioned, is that the address of the segment or the virtual page number, as we're going to refer to it, and the offset are always going to be concatenated together. Pages are fixed sized, typically 4K, and we're using the least significant bits. So log base 2 of 4K results in 12 bits of address for the page offset, and the most significant bits above it are the page number. So in a modern x86 machine with a 32-bit address space, 20 bits on an x86 machine with a 32-bit address space, 20 bits are for the virtual page number, and 12 bits, the bottom 12 bits, are for the page offset. And each process is gonna have a table that looks kind of like the segment table that maps a virtual page number to a physical page number. In the OS lecture, we'll see how this can be done in hardware or in software and several strategies that can be used to implement this. But at a high level, we have a protection bit, the virtual page number and a physical page number, which allows to map addresses. We just take the virtual page number and replace it with a physical page number and check the protection bits to see if the operation is valid. The lower bits don't change in any way. You don't need to add or compare them because every page has to be a full four kilobyte size in this example or whatever the fixed page size is of that machine. On a memory access, you just translate the VPN to the PPN and concatenate the offset as I mentioned. So in this example we see here, the virtual page number is three. We look it up in the table, which corresponds to a one, and we concatenate the one with the offset, which in this case is 128. Paging does come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. One of the earlier machines to implement paging was the PDP-11, which influenced Unix. In the PDP-11, we had only 64 kilobytes of virtual memory and we had eight kilobyte pages. So there weren't a lot of pages. There were only eight physical pages and eight virtual pages within the address space. We separated the address space for code instruction and data. So you couldn't read your own instructions with the load instruction. So it gives a little bit more space to work with. And the entire page table is stored in eight mapping registers, the eight registers for the instruction mappings and eight for the data mappings. Whenever we do a context switch, whenever we switch between two different applications, two different processes specifically, we have to swap all 16 registers to present to the processor a different set of mappings. So in the rest of the lecture, we're gonna look at two examples of memory management units. And then in the future lecture, we'll see how this is implemented, how this is used by the operating system. The two main flavors that you'll see of memory management units are hardware managed and software managed. A hardware managed memory management unit reloads the TLB with some kind of hardware. And this is gonna actually mean that the data structure of the page tables in memory are specified typically by the hardware. It requires more complexity in the hardware. And as a few examples, we can see x86, modern ARM64, and modern Power 9s and above support hardware managed page tables. Other processors use software managed page tables. These make it simpler for the hardware but it means that more often we're going to reload pages through the operating system into the TLB. The TLB on both, in both cases, there is a TLB inside the processor that functions as a cache for page table mappings. And this TLB on most systems ranges from about 32 mappings to about 1,500 mappings. 
The software approaches tend to be more flexible. It allows the OS to make smarter decisions and it allows more customization in how page tables work. For example, most software managed TLBs allow variable page sizes, while the hardware managed TLBs have a lot more restriction on the very different types of size pages that you can use. Examples of this are gonna be MIPS, which is what we use in OS 161, the Spark architecture, Alpha, earlier ARM and power architectures. And even modern ARM and powers still support software managed TLBs as some of the OSs running on them use them still. So let's continue and let's look at two examples for the rest of the lecture. We'll look at x86's hardware managed MMU and then we'll look at how MIPS has a software managed MMU and this will help build an understanding that we'll use for the OS side of virtual memory management. In x86, the page tables are controlled through two main registers. CR0, you can think of these as the privileged coprocessor in the MIPS. The CR0 register allows you to turn on and off paging and to control some paging behavior. And normally, pages are all gonna be four kilobytes in size. And the CR3 control register contains what's called the page directory. This is the main structure that describes the page tables. This is a really nice example to work through because most operating systems will use something like this to describe their memory management or often use it as a form of a cache for some underlying more complicated data structures. In your OS 161 project, you should probably implement something that resembles the page table design of the x86 architecture. So let's look at this now in more detail. The page tables in the basic version that's used in earlier 32-bit processors come in two levels. The page directory, which has 1,024 page directory entries, and the page table that has 1,024 page table entries. Each page table entry corresponds to a four kilobyte page, and each page table represents four megabytes of virtual memory. So here I'm showing the basic structure, and it's essentially a two level tree that is used to describe page translations. The CR3 register shown at the bottom points to the page directory. The page directory is a four kilobyte page itself that then points to another physical address known as the directory entry pointing to a page table. It's the base address of the page table. The first 10 bits allows of, an, of an, a virtual address or linear address allows you to find which directory entry within the page directory is used. It represents, remember, four megabytes of memory. So the remaining 21 bits or 22 bits of the virtual address are a four megabyte offset. The next 10 bits are used to index into the page table itself. Remember that the page table and the page directory res reside somewhere in physical memory. The page table entry points to the base address of the four kilobyte page that is the physical address in memory of that virtual address. So we concatenate the remaining 12 bits as an offset into the actual page in physical memory with the pointer coming off the page table entry. So you can see here that all this is really is what's known as a radix tree. It's just a two level tree where at each level there's a fixed size with 1,024 entries. And this allows us in total to represent two to the 20 pages. So why would we wanna do this? Why is it that even in the hardware, we didn't just make a single linear table for all of memory? And the reason is, is that memory can be sparse. We don't always wanna use all of memory. The application might be at a very low address, libc and the stack might be at higher addresses the heat might be somewhere random at another random location in memory and this means that if i were to allocate a single table for all of the page tables i would either have 
two to the 20 pages or about a million pages, which if each entry was four bytes in size, then that would be about four megabytes that I would waste for each application. Some applications are gonna be smaller than four megabytes. So we'd be wasting more memory for virtual memory management than the application itself. And the alternative, which might be to scan through the table for a smaller table of mappings, doesn't really work well in hardware because it's gonna be very slow to read through the entire four megabyte region to find the correct mapping. This architecture allows the hardware implementation to require essentially just two loads. It computes the directory entry offset, reads it from physical memory, computes the page table entry offset, reads that from physical memory, and then it'll know the mapping and it'll take this mapping and stick it into a TLB that's gonna cache it for hopefully future accesses and amortize some of this overhead of these lookups. Each of these entries encodes a bunch of bits that gives us control over the behavior of the processor and what the application can do. In the page directory entry, we have a present bit that tells us whether the page table below exists. This allows us to have these sparse page tables because we can basically tell the processor, don't keep looking, there's no page table below this. A read and write bit that allows us to mark the entire region readable or writable. The user supervisor bit, this tells us whether it's application memory or kernel memory. And then some bits that are used for cache control and caching within the TLB. One of the important ones is the page size bit. So typically the page size bit will be zero, but the page size bit can be set to one to mean that the page directory entry points directly to a four megabyte region of memory. That's right, in x86, even though it's hardware managed, we can have two page sizes in these early systems, four kilobyte pages and four megabyte pages. The four megabyte page takes the address from this page directory entry and points to a physical address, replacing the top 10 bits of the virtual page number. And this for smaller size pages, then this address is just the address of the page table and we'll then find the four kilobyte page within that page table. Again, similarly, in the page table entries, we have the same set of bits, as I mentioned. The present bit that says whether or not this entry is valid or not, whether or not the memory is mapped, the read and write bit, and the user supervisor bit. On 64-bit machines, they also add a, execute, a no execute bit to allow us to make some memory non-executable. One of the reasons that I chose x86 to look at a hardware managed TLB is that x86 is interesting for another reason. It also has segmentation. The x86 architecture first uses the segmentation to translate an address by adding its base and checking against its limit into a linear address or virtual address, and then takes the virtual address and maps that to a physical address using page tables. Segmentation is also interesting because it introduces multiple privilege levels. While paging and most processors just have a user mode and a kernel mode, the x86 designers originally envisioned supporting older style operating systems would become more commodity like Multics and VMS that have multiple rings of protection where different parts of the OS and system are encapsulating each other and protecting each other from crashes. The kernel gets control of several of these rings and the user is usually in ring three. So why would you want both paging and segmentation? The answer is that generally you don't. Most operating systems today just set the base to zero and the bound to the four, full three range of memory and forget about segmentation and just use the paging to deal with memory management. But there are a set of applications that have been used, most of them security related, that use segmentation. So the first of those is virtualization. So one of the common uses of this was to essentially protect the virtual machine monitor. So what is virtualization? Firstly, virtualization 
is essentially a very high performance emulation for running an OS and other applications inside of an existing system. Essentially two levels where we can have multiple OSs and many applications under each running, sharing the same physical hardware and multiplexing that hardware the same way we multiplex applications on a single OS. VMware was one of the companies to recently bring this back. It had been done back in the 70s, but it's been done a lot recently to deal with the issue that we underutilize resources. We could pack many servers into a single physical server and share the box. And underneath this, what's driving this is what's called a virtual machine monitor. It's the core emulation that emulates CPU behavior and hardware, a lot of common hardware devices. And the key differentiating factor between the emulation and virtualization, why we don't just call it emulation, is that unlike emulation systems that interpret instructions and try to simulate the behavior of the hardware, virtualization tries as much as possible to run the application and the OS that's known as the guest OS inside on the physical processor that you're on. So we try to run it on bare metal so the overhead is very low and performance is almost the same as running on physical hardware itself. We only take over to manipulate the OS and to deal with servicing various requests when we need to emulate virtual devices or emulate some CPU behavior that we can't just trust the guest OS to do directly. In the early days of virtualization, this was done purely through software techniques. So a small piece of code known as the virtual machine monitor that had all the high performance emulation support in it ran in the top four megabytes of memory. The remaining memory was given to the guest OS, the remaining virtual memory, was given to the guest OS and to the guest application. The guest OS would run in CPL1 using the ring protection available through segments, and both the guest OS and the guest applications were limited to all of memory minus the top four megabytes. This ensured that the application and the guest OS can't read or touch or damage in any way the hypervisor, the virtual machine monitor that's doing most of the emulation, and when the virtual machine monitor ran, it ran in CPL0, and it had access to all of memory so it could perform all the emulation tasks that it was required to. Another common reason that segmentation has been used is really for a lot of applications and security. OpenBSD, for example, would limit the code segment to make sure that, that stack and some of these readable regions of memory were not writable and executable at the same time. And this is because in early x86 processors, we didn't have a no execute bit in the page table entries. There are many other research systems and production systems that have used segments for various forms of protection to help protect some code from other code to run potentially unsafe code. And there've been other approaches to doing this today in software now that segmentation is on its way out. I should note that in the case of VMware, segmentation, while it doesn't really exist in modern 64-bit processors, Intel processors, it does exist in early 64-bit processors from AMD. Even though these are the same architecture, AMD wanted to support virtualization right off the bat, so it kept a weakened version of segmentation just enough for VMware's needs. This is poorly documented and references are available online, but it's not in the core documentation and it doesn't really exist in modern 64-bit machines anymore. Obviously, all the virtualization has been replaced and all modern 64-bit processors support hardware support for virtualization where most of the emulation or more of the emulation is occurring in the CPU itself as part of the hardware. Okay, so let's step back. How do we make paging fast? In x86, the page tables I described require up to three memory references per load or store. We might have to look up the page table in the page directory, 
and then look up in the page table the actual physical address and then do the load or store corresponding to the virtual address as requested by the application. This would really slow down the system by a factor of three effectively if we really had to do this on every access. So how do we get around this? Well, to make this faster, the CPU has a cache for mappings known as the translation look aside buffer. This is just like the general MMU we described, that there's a cache for mappings in the processor. And this is exactly the same way that the software managed TLBs work, where there's this TLB that has a cache of mappings. In x86's case, depending on the architecture and the specific CPU that you're on, this cache can range anywhere from 64 to about 2000 entries. And it typically is gonna have a very high hit rate because it can represent a large amount of physical memory or virtual memory. On each memory reference on every load or store, we can check the cache and this check is incredibly fast. And if it's not in this TLB, we then can walk the page tables and incur up to those three memory references if needed and then reload the TLB. So if there's some locality in your program, and typically this follows the 80-20 rule, where most of the references are gonna be in a small region of memory, we're gonna see locality where we're gonna continually access things that are already loaded in the TLB, and occasionally we'll have to access things that are not. In a lot of applications, we see something like a 95% hit rate for the TLB, reducing the number of times that we actually need to make lookups in the page directory or page tables. The TLB operates essentially at the CPU speed. This is one reason that it has to be fairly small. It can't be giant to represent all of memory. It has to be small and incredibly fast for us to be able to use it like this. So one of the complications that we have to start thinking about when we think about OS design is what do we do when we switch between processes? What do we do when we switch address spaces? Remember that a process typically has one address space for the entire process. And so different ad processes have different address spaces. Well, when we switch processes, we have to flush the TLB. And this can be a bit costly as you're flushing up to 2000 mappings. And in general, the operating system has to do some special work to manage the TLB and keep it valid. There are a couple ways that the TLB can be invalidated. Reloading CR3 is one, but on x86, there's also instructions inval PG, which invalidate a single page mapping. And this is more complicated on multi-core machines where when we're updating a mapping of a process and removing it, we have to ensure that we remove it across all threads or all cores that are currently running. So we do something called a TLB shootdown where we signal to all CPUs to stop if they're running this program and then tell them to invalidate the mapping and then the, um, an updated mapping can be provided and the process can continue running. So this brings us to one more last question, which is where does the operating system live? Does it live in its own address space well, in most hardware, this doesn't work. Most hardware doesn't support giving a separate address space for the heart for the operating system. And it would make things harder because then you'd need to have special load store instructions when the operating system and the application move data across during system calls. So typically in almost all modern operating systems, the operating system and the application live in the same address space. And we only use the protection bits to restrict the process, the application, from accessing, reading, or writing kernel memory. Typically all of the kernel text, most data, are all shared are now gonna be available in every address space. That means while a process has its own view of application memory, the region of memory that corresponds to the kernel memory is gonna be shared across all processes. This makes it easier to do IPC and to implement lots of parts of the operating system. On x86, 
This is a manual process where the operating system specifically keeps a set of page tables for, e for the operating system, and those will be shared potentially across cores. Some of those might be unique to cores. And then the rest of memory below will be used by the application. On most x86 OSs, either the top two gigabytes on 32-bit machines or the top one gigabyte are reserved for the operating system. And to make this simpler, most of the time, that region of memory maps to physical memory. We'll see this res resembles the architecture on MIPS where they do a similar thing. Now this brings us to our last example for today, the software managed TLB or software managed MMU. And we're gonna use a little bit about MIPS and OS161 to understand how this works. So MIPS has a very different design for an MMU than x86. What it does basically is it exposes the TLB, and in this case it's a 64 entry TLB, directly to the operating system. All loads or stores are gonna be mapped through the TLB, and if they don't exist in the TLB, we'll get a trap. If you recall the lecture when we talked about interrupts and exceptions, we saw that there was a specific exception vector at a specific address that was used for handling TLB misses. Because the TLB is small, unlike the x86 architecture, we expect that the operating system will receive traps more often because less of the application can be represented, and then it will have to service in a very optimized fashion these requests from the TLB. And many sophisticated operating systems have a two-level design. They have some kind of cache that's immediately used to service TLB requests. And when the cache that's implemented in software doesn't contain an entry, then it falls back to a more complicated data structure that is used to represent memory. We'll see an example of these kinds of data structures and this structure in the next lecture. Each TLB entry has a virtual page number, a process ID, we'll get to that in a moment, a page frame or a physical page number. When in MIPS, they're called page frames. And a no cacheable bit, a dirty bit, a valid bit, and a global bit. The kernel itself is unpaged. We'll see in a few slides that we have a fixed layout of memory that reserves regions of memory that are designed for the kernel to run. And the kernel on most modern MIPS also have a little region of pageable memory for them to be able to access any physical address they need. The unpaged region that's for the kernel, even though it's in a high virtual address, it actually corresponds to the beginning of physical memory. Whenever a page fault occurs, the user TLB fault handler runs, and as I mentioned, it has to be very efficient, leading to this design where it's often written in handwritten assembly, provides its own software cache that's much larger than the TLB, that's usually a hash table, and when that hash table doesn't contain the entry, then it falls back to a slower path for the remaining processing. The, one of the benefits of this approach, and the main benefit really, is that the operating system's free to choose its own page table format. It's free to use any data structures that it wants, but it comes with this trade-off of these different choices in the performance of fault handling and falling back to the software fault handling and the size of the TLB and the cost of context switches. So let's briefly look at what virtual memory looks like in the MIPS architecture. MIPS provides a set of segments, the USEG, the USEG is pageable user memory, and you can see this represented the first two gigabytes of the virtual address space. So a process can be up to two gigabytes in size in the MIPS architecture. And then the kernel memory that is in the top two gigabytes. And the kernel memory has three segments. We're not really gonna get into the upper segments, but basically, in OS161, we generally run in what's called known as KSEG0. And this is a physical cached region of memory. So KSEG0, even though it's at a virtual address of two gigabytes, you can 
remove the top bits and access the top bit and access it as physical memory. It corresponds to the first 512 megabytes of physical memory. KSEG1 is an identical mapping of the same 512 megabytes, but it's uncached. We'll see in the device lecture and the IO lectures that this is used for device accesses. And finally, KSEG2, which we won't use in this course, is a mappable region of kernel memory that allows the kernel to map in other memory it might need. It might map other device memory, it might map physical addresses that are above 512 megabytes, or map in memory of another application or process when doing IPC or communication between processes. In MIPS, the TLB is controlled through the coprocessor, through coprocessor zero. The TLB, as I mentioned, consists of 64 entries. Each one is 64 bits in size. It has the process ID. It has this no cacheable bit, a dirty bit, or writable when, when you're writing to the actual page, a valid bit, and a global bit. So there's two important bits here that we should mention. The first is the PID one and the global bit. If you paid close attention on the x86 portion of this talk, the global bit also exists in x86, and actually something similar to the PID one exists, but I didn't show it in the diagram. The global bit basically says to ignore the PID bits and that this page mapping is global to all of memory. This might be used for KSEG2 or for some kind of shared page that all processes have. The PID bit allows for what's known as a tag TLB. In order to reduce the cost of flushing and invalidating the TLB, we can actually have multiple processes, TLBs, loaded at the same time. So we only have 64 entries, but if we're switching frequently between two processes and using very little memory, some of the TLB entries of the other process could still be valid. And we just have to tell the processor what PID we're running under. And that PID is just the process ID, just uniquely identifies each process so that the mapping can be compared against the current process ID to know whether or not that mapping is currently valid or it should result in a fault and have the OS reload the mapping. This structure also allows for more page sizes than x86. Remember in x86, you could only have four kilobyte pages and four meg pages. And that was limited by the structure of the page table entries and page directory entries. This approach of having a software managed TLB has many more page sizes as shown here, anywhere from four kilobyte to 16 megabyte. This makes it easier for the operating system to represent in as few as possible page pages or page TLB entries really, the memory of a process. So if you can keep most of a process contiguous, you could use the largest possible mapping you can to represent that mapping of a page in the page tables. So as I mentioned, the process ID allows multiple processes to coexist within the TLB. This is nice because we don't have to flush the TLB on a context switch. We can set the process ID and only flush the TLB when we're reusing a PID for a new process. The current PID is gonna be stored in coprocessor zero under this field called entry high. The global bit, as I mentioned, tells you the processor whether or not the process ID field is valid or not for a given entry. So a common use, as I mentioned, is that in KSEG2, these are kernel pages, and often these are gonna be shared across all processes because the kernel address space is going to be uniform across all processes. And those pages will often be marked global. To manage the TLB, the coprocessor zero introduces four main instructions. TLB write random, which is going to write to a random slot within the TLB. Remember that the TLB is fully associative. So writing to any slot will allow a mapping to be present in the system. TLB write index 
which gives the operating system even more control where it could overwrite a specific mapping. This is good if we're updating a mapping from writable, from readable to writable, or downgrading it from writable to readable, or making it now valid when it was invalid for some reason. TLB read that allows us to read a specific slot and TLB probe that allows us to find the slot containing a specific address. In all of these instructions, we use three main registers, C0 entry high, entry low that contain the top and bottom 32 bits of a TLB entry, and C0 index that contains the index into the TLB from zero to 32. In MIPS, there are three types of TLB exceptions. A user TLB miss, meaning that the user, the useg, didn't contain a TLB entry. A TLB miss, which means that kseg2 didn't contain a matching entry. And TLB mod, which means that there was an attempt to, re to write to a read-only page. The user TLB handler, as we saw in the exception lecture, is separate from the general exception handler. The user TLB misses are gonna be frequent because if we think about it, the TLB is only 64 entries in size. If every page was four kilobytes, we'd only cover a 256 kilobyte process, which is very small. So when a process exceeds that size, it's going to trigger a user TLB miss requiring the OS to reload the TLB. This was done by hardware in x86 that did up to three memory references to reload the TLB. Here, the OS runs an exception handler to process the TLB miss. If we think of on modern machines, most applications are gonna be larger than 256 kilobytes of memory. There are a couple ways that MIPS processes, MIPS OSs can deal with this. One is to use multiple page sizes, allowing them to represent a lot more memory. Remember that pages could be up to 16 megabytes in size. And the operating system can write a very optimized user TLB handler. On most software managed TLBs, you'll find that this is often a two level handler. The first one using a hash table to look up entries in assembly. And if the entry doesn't match, it'll fall back to a slower handler that walks some kind of tree structures that describe all the memory mappings. The basic algorithm of the way that the hardware works is that the most significant bit describes whether or not the memory address is in user mode or in kernel mode. If the most significant bit is one, we know it's a kernel mode access and we get an address error exception immediately. If no virtual page number map matches in the TLB, then we'll generate a TLB miss exception if the most significant bit is one, otherwise a user TLB miss. If the PID mismatches and the global bit is not set, we'll generate again a TLB miss because the entry is invalid. And finally, if the valid bit is not set, we also generate a TLB miss. Now what's remaining is that if you attempt to write to a read-only page and the TLB has that page marked as read-only, then a TLB mod exception is generated to say that we're trying to modify a page that was read-only. And a few other things occur like the end bit, which just basically says that whenever you access a page whose page table entry is n, meaning non-cacheable, it's gonna disable the cache and it's gonna directly process the read and write to memory. This is gonna be used in the devices to deal with devices. In OS161, as you'll see when you start working on the project, a few assembly wrappers are provided that help make this easier. There are four main functions, TLB random, which writes to a random TLB entry, right? This is the TLB write random instruction, TLB write, TLB read, and TLB probe that provides you with all the functions you need to manipulate the TLB and not have to write the handwritten assembly. 
in that OS assignment, at, toward the end, you're gonna implement a Radex tree very similar to the x86 approach. In fact, you can basically just take the x86 structure and use that as your design. As a side note, the OS, the way it stands right now when you're using it before you've implemented this is basically using a simplified version of segments that has just a few segments using the page table hardware. It computes the segment computations and then it loads the TLB with the appropriate page. So I wanted to lastly leave off with looking at what an application looks like when it's in memory which is gonna help us when we start talking about the OS side of things later. So if an application has a full control of its virtual address space, what does it look like? So I'm using this example here, one of the test binaries that we use in OS161, user test bin sort, to see what the memory layout looks at. And you can use a tool called read elf as a way to visualize this layout. And you can see that there are three segments that that test bin binary uses when it's running. The first is the text or and read-only data segment, which is at the four megabyte boundary. It's less than eight kilobytes in size or two pages. The data segment, which is at a higher address and the stack that grows down from the top two gigabyte boundary as much as needed. In the next lecture, we'll get into more detail about the OS side of things and look a little more about how an application is laid out in the virtual address space.